thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, it's excellent to see so many people um, here ready for today's webinar. Record number of signups for today's webinar. So we're very excited to share our experiences with you all. We are Accessable. We're a global leading provider of detailed disabled access information. And today's session will focus on supporting neurodivergent people. A couple of very quick notes on housekeeping. So the session is being recorded and we will share a recording with everybody who has registered after the session. All of our audience members have their microphones muted um, and we ask all panellists to please mute their microphones when you're not speaking. We will be using the chat function today. Um, my colleague Lucy will be responsible for, uh, for replying, responding and keeping on top of those chat messages. So feel free to drop any questions or comments in there and we'll do our very best to bring them out throughout the session. We will also have time for a short Q&A at the end of the session. And um, for anybody who needs to use captions today, you can turn those on um, on Microsoft Teams by clicking more language and speech and then turn on live caption. My name is Carrie Ann Lightley. I'm head of marketing and communications at Accessable. I am a white woman in my mid 30s with curly brown hair. I'm wearing a green jumper and I'm wearing glasses. My lived experience relating to the session is that I have cerebral palsy and I also have complex PTSD, which is becoming recognised under the umbrella of neurodivergence. So I'm going to move on to introductions um, from our speakers, etc. So first, I'd just like to ask Lucy Wood to just briefly introduce yourself. Thank you. Hello everybody, thank you Carrie Ann. As Carrie Ann said, my name is Lucy Woods. I will be moderate, mod, moderating the chat today. Um, so if you've got any questions or want to raise a point during any point of the discussion, please pop your um, thoughts into the chat message and we'll make sure that it's um, got to at some point during the session. I'm a white woman wearing glasses with red hair and wearing a pink jumper. I'm a wheelchair user and I've worked for Accessable for about five years. Thanks so much, Lucy. Um, so absolutely pop your questions and comments in the chat and feel free also um, if anybody would like to you know, contribute to that discussion, answer anybody else's questions. If you feel like you've got some insight, absolutely feel free to do that. So I'm now going to ask our panellists to introduce themselves. Um, with name, uh, a description of yourself, your lived experience and the work you do related to the session. So I'm going to come to Lydia first. Hi everyone, um, my name is Lydia Wilkins. I am a white woman. I have shoulder length brown curly hair as well as probably quite large brown glasses. My lived experience to in relation to this webinar, um, I almost feel like I have no kind of like an alphabet list of kind of disabilities to sort of reel off by this point. Um, so I am autistic. I have been diagnosed for nearly 10 years now. I recently found out that I also probably have dyspraxia, diagnosis pending. I am also a long COVID patient, which has a multiplicity of very fun things to add on to that. Um, in terms of what I do elsewhere, I I work as a freelance journalist. I am the incoming editor at Disability Review magazine. The first issue that I'm editing will be out in March. I do a lot of stuff outside of Accessable where I'm also the editor and obviously an ambassador of for Accessable, I edit the newsletter. I'm currently doing some things to do with the criminal justice system and where it meets disability. Thank you, Lydia. A very comprehensive introduction there. Um, Hannah, we'll come to you next. Please. 
Um, hello everyone, I'm Dr. Hannah Barron Brown. Um, I my visual description is that I'm a white woman with very short, kind of slightly chaotic red curly hair um, and big red glasses. I'm currently sitting in my clinical room because my morning clinic as a GP somewhat unsurprisingly massively overran. So I'm doing this from work. Um, so yes, I'm a GP, but I'm also in the process of writing a couple of books, uh, primarily on disability and trying to create a disability rights manifesto. Um, and I'm also an accessible ambassador and I'm a wheelchair user. So we've got a fun few things going on, um, but I also have ADHD, which is why I'm here today. Thank you so much, Hannah. Hester, welcome to you, last the introduction, please. Hi there, I'm Hester Granger. I'm a white woman wearing glasses. Um, I've got long brown hair and I'm wearing a lilac jumper. And I've got a pink and green wall behind me with a door behind it and a couple of pictures on it. Um, so as I said, I'm Hester. I was diagnosed with ADHD at 43. Um, I'm co-founder of Perfectly Autistic, which is a neurodiversity workplace consultancy that I run with my autistic and ADHD husband, Kelly. We've been going for about three and a half years now and we work with um, workplaces and organisations to help support them, um, understanding um, the benefits of having neurodivergent employees and customers and clients as well. Um, we do talks, training, webinars, and I'm also a certified ADHD coach. Um, I'm also a parent, I'm a mum to two autistic ADHD children, um, both nearly teens, and my daughter is also dyspraxic. Thank you, Esther. Um, very excited to have you all on the session today. So a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, so during today's webinar, you'll learn about improving accessibility for and awareness of neurodivergence, avoiding common stereotypes and misconceptions, how working environments can be made more accessible, the role of reasonable adjustments, and we'll also be sharing best practice case study examples. We'll now begin the panel discussion where you'll get insight into each of our individual panelists lived experience this will reflect the reality of their impairment and is not intended to be comprehensive pan disability advice but we hope that you will find it useful panelists um, our first slide we're going to focus on assumptions um, realities of living and working with your disability or condition and the language that you're most comfortable using and what you're most comfortable for others to use when speaking about neurodivergence and just to qualify on that language point we um you know we very much appreciate and respect that language is individual preference here and that's really why we want to bring this out so panelists please use the raise hand function when you're ready to uh, jump in and ask these questions I will come to each of you in the order that that happens. So Hannah, you put your hand up first. <laughs> uh, cracking, fastest finger first. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of the assumptions that people make regarding my disability, particularly my ADHD, are around things that they perceive I can't do. Um, so when I, I was only diagnosed about three, four years ago, when I was struggling a lot with some of the exams that you have to do to become a GP. Um, and when I was going through the process of diagnosis, I had a medical colleague turn to me and say, oh, don't be silly. You can't have ADHD. You have four bachelor's degrees. Um, and there was just this assumption that you couldn't be a doctor and be neurodivergent, um, which is somewhat ridiculous because actually current estimates are that around 15 percent of general practitioners in particular have some level of neurodivergence or some diagnosis. Um, so it is it's really frustrating and very shocking that this is still the attitude that's out there. Um, in fact, I find that actually in many ways, my neurodivergence really helps me with the kind of work I do. Um, I've spent my entire life having to very quickly read people um, to try and work out how to best interact with them, to see how they're going to respond to my neurodivergence, my being a bit different in massive inverted commas. And so that actually means that when I'm getting a new person coming into this room every, you know, seven minutes on average, I've got very good at very quickly assessing, you know, how they're feeling, what might be going on for them and making those decisions. So there's kind of an almost an enhanced um, empathy, I would suggest, that comes with ADHD. And there's lots of interesting evidence around that. Um, so actually, I find that 
having ADHD has been quite a benefit in general practice. I'm somebody that needs a lot of like new stimulation and new things happening. And I get a new person walking through that door every 10 minutes with a new problem, or in my case, normally multiple new problems that they want to talk to me about. So it actually fits my neurodivergence really, really well. And I think that's one of the most frustrating things when it comes to the assumptions people make is that they sit there going, oh, this must be a real barrier for you. When in reality, I think often it's quite the opposite. It's something that gives me strength in the role I do. Um, in terms of the realities of living and working with my disability, some days are better than others. Um, I'm somebody that always benefits from having a portfolio career. So I work clinically three days a week, um, partly because physically I can't do much more than that, but also because I become mentally very, very exhausted with the constant masking and meeting a new person every 10 minutes. Um, so actually that works really well for me. And it means that I can have a few days a week where I'm doing speaking engagements or consultancy work or writing books or whatever else it may be. Um, and that works very well for me. And I find that if I try and do too much of one thing, that's when I tend to burn out and that's when I start to really struggle with it. So that variety is really important with me. Um, and finally, in terms of the language, so I personally refer to myself as all sorts of things, um, depending on how frustrated I am with my brain, because that does occasionally happen. Um, I often say that I'm somewhat neuro spicy or neuro glittery, because you know what? I I want to have some fun with this. Um, it's not phrases I would use to refer to other people, though. And that is the absolutely key thing. We talk about neurodivergence. Um, we talk more widely about neurodiversity across the whole population. But yeah, I'm happy to say I'm neurospicy or neuroglittery, depending on how queer I'm feeling that particular day. So yeah, hope that helps. Thanks so much, Hannah. I have, I have heard neuro spicy being banding around and I do like that, but I've not heard neuro glittery before. And I think, I think I'm going to have to borrow that because it's excellent. So thank you. Hester, we'll come to you next, please. Hi, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it did very much feel like a game show though, didn't it? Fastest finger first. I think Lydia may have beaten me, but that's fine. So I think the assumptions people make with my disability is that I don't have ADHD. Firstly, so I'm 46, I was diagnosed at 43, and I was told, even though the children at the time were like 10 and 12, oh, you've just got mum brain. This was by friends, obviously not any clinicians. Um, and I think outwardly, I'm seen as having it quite together. Like I'm organised, I have to be, I remember to feed and water my children regularly and do everything that I need to do to keep them growing as healthy, happy people. Um, but that takes so much effort. The organisation skills behind um, working, like Hannah was saying, I think a portfolio um, sort of career really suits me. I've done, I've worked out, I've had 30 different full-time jobs over the years. Um, I wasn't fired from any of them. I always have to <laughs> add that as a caveat. But, you know, I just get bored really easily. And so I think the assumption is that Actually, I'm just, you know, a busy mum. I get told that a lot. Oh, it's just you're busy. So you haven't got ADHD. That's why you're a bit forgetful. Or that's why you have to, you know, rewash the washing for like the fourth time that week because you haven't managed to get it out of the washing machine or these things. And I think, yeah, that's basically the main assumption is that I don't have ADHD. Um, and yeah, I find that, I do find that really interesting. Um, the realities of living and working with ADHD are the highs and the lows so um i now very much know what causes burnout with me um i was on a bit of a sort of cycle about a year or so ago i was incredibly busy doing lots of different things because part of me having adhd is the dopamine hit of saying yes to things um so that's something i definitely try and do less of now and try and be more selective um and so i think the living with adhd is that it can sometimes just be quite overwhelming when you just get really frustrated when you can't do something um either sort of from an executive function point of view or actually just not having the physical energy to do it also as I said I parent autistic and my autistic and ADHD children so as a house we are a very neurodivergent house if you can say that um with lots of different com sort of conflicting needs um I think the realities of living with my condition so working is that actually it makes me really good at what I do I'm do a lot of public speaking um do lots of workshops and training um whenever we work with companies they get a lot out of me because 
I have a high word count and I talk a lot, so we cover a lot during any session. Um, and actually, I just love meeting new people. And I think having um, this sort of multi-hyphenate career really does suit me. Um, language, most comfortable, I just say I have ADHD. I don't really think about it much more than that. Um, do love neuroglittery because I do love anything glittery and sparkly. But yeah, I just say I have ADHD. Hope that helps. Amazing. Thank you so much, Hester. Lydia, finally, we'll come to you. Thank you. So when the question was first asked as to what assumptions do people make when it comes to your disability or condition? Um, my first thought was, can somebody commission me to write a book about this? Because this is a topic that I could talk about for a very long time. Um, I was diagnosed as autistic when I was two months shy of turning 16. And the the kind of assumption, therefore, and uh, thereafter has always been kind of like an eternal child stereotype. And I say this in the sense of when I've asked for help when going into organisations, um, it's been as soon as I said that I'm autistic, I need help. It's very kind of people who intend to be well, but they become immediately very sort of infantilizing. So they start to talk in a very loud voice. Um, I can understand you. I am like, you know, talking to you. And also there's the thing of privacy and all the rest of it. Um, and they, there is a idea that we need kind of simplified childlike language. That's it fundamentally misunderstands the point of an autistic person can sometimes need just something that's very clear and concise rather than just sort of making it child appropriate. I'm nearly 25. I'm not a child. <laughs> um, it's also when the autonomy very often to make choices is taken from me, particularly when going into kind of like medical settings or even just if I was to go to my local Sainsbury's, there's been occasions where I've asked for help just to say something like, where is the fish counter? It sounds very silly, but it's the thing of where thereafter it's been the thing of where individuals have decided what fish that I should be having rather than listening to me as the autistic person and all that kind of thing. Um, what are the realities of living and working with your disability or condition? Um, autistic people are part of the least employed disability group. So we've sort of touched upon the multi hyphenate career and how it can be very suitable for ADHD individuals um, and all that kind of thing. Um, I would say it can be sort of alienatory in the respect of, I believe in the social model of disability in that it is society that disables me. I love the idea of neuroglitter in the sense of you have all this sort of weird and wonderful brains that just sort of glitter and they glow in the dark almost. And there's something quite new and exciting and outside the arbitrary in that rather than just sort of going with this standardized kind of society says you're wrong therefore you need to be fixed type thing there that so that's what i mean by the reality of living as an autistic person um in terms of language um so for me personally i prefer autistic rather than with autism with autism is very controversial if you google it it's a long and dark history um but as we sort of said, maybe just ask the person first instead of kind of like, you know, the other participants have said, like, you know, this is for me personally. If we just ask people what they prefer, it goes a long way. Yeah, I completely agree with that last point, Nidia, on language. I think language is personal preference. And I know that a lot of people <clears throat> get very nervous or hesitant around what language they should use when discussing disability. Um, and I think, yeah, the best advice is really to be led by the individual um, and that if you're if you're addressing a group of people at an organisational level, I would always advise using social model language first and foremost. And there are lots of resources on the internet we can talk about that as well. Thank you. So I'm now going to move on to our next slide. So we're going to talk about a, a bit more depth about the realities of living and working from your lived experience as a neurodivergent person. We're going to talk about the support that you need, any aids or equipment that you find helpful and um, 
common stereotypes and misconceptions around neurodivergence that businesses should try to avoid. Feel free to raise hands, panelists. I shall come to you in order. Lydia, you put your hand up first, so we'll come to you first. It's very kind of like game show this, isn't it? Raise your hand. It sort of reminds me of the chase. Um, so um, in terms of what support do you need? Um, so I can only talk about my own support needs. This is not necessarily prescriptive. I think the rule of thumb is the, the individual rather than sort of describing like, you know, a demographic. In, I do not speak for every autistic person. Um, what support do I need? Um, so for starters um they're very i love the access guys and i say this in the sense that i came to access able because i'd known carrie ann for about a year before i did so i was sort of aware of, about access able and started using it and kind of like if i had to go to a medical appointment um so for autistic people there's very often things that such as a social story where kind of like the functionality of what you do in an organization is mapped out so if you go to an airport what to expect the process that kind of thing or if you go to a supermarket social stories can be used across a wide range of ages and i really want to put i really want to stress this because i would love to see more of this and this is why i use the access guides because they're sort of ageless social stories have become kind of in a way they've become sort of infantilized in that they're for people under the age of 18 and yet there's sort of that's the only support that's available very often um aids or equipment that i find helpful um i am hypersensitive to noise and I love the that some organisations now kind of have um, sometimes they call it power down hour where all the noise, everything is closed off maybe once a month. But these are very often kind of like ridiculously early hours to go into an organisation like 8am. So it's the thing where it's very often incumbent on me because I can't necessarily access going into an organisation at a very early hour. So in answer to the question, that's just kind of like for contextual reasons. I have earplugs that filter out the sound. I know that Hester is a massive fan of, I think it's loops. Um, I love the fact that Hannah's sort of nodding to this. Um, I also use things such as fidgets and that kind of thing just as a kind of self-regulation, but that's incumbent on me. I love that some organisations now have things such as sensory backpacks, but that could be kind of used across ages rather than making it because there's very often an age restriction. Um, as to common stereotypes and misconceptions around neurodivergence, um, we've got to talk about Rain Man. Rain Man is older than me, and yet that is still a stereotype that follows me around seemingly everywhere. Um, if I go into an organisation, very often my needs are not being met because there's a kind of a conflict between the physical and the neurology in the sense that it's very often not taken in tandem. A body might not be functioning physically, but it does not detract from the fact that I'm autistic. The two separate things, they should be considered in tandem with each other. Um, and I say this in the sense very often I have to play at being the educator in the sense of, oh, autistic woman, tell me all about it. Like there's such an expectation on me to do the kind of, well, this is what this means and therefore you should be doing that and this is your obligation when there should be, that should already be met almost. I also want to point out, so neurodiversity is protected by the equality act as well so very often in kind of like businesses medical settings whatever i've come across things where they go oh you're autistic but we don't talk about that because everyone's equal here you need to meet my needs in the equality act for basic kind of access to something it's not making someone unequal it's not taking away from other people that it tends to annoy me because then I have to read the right act, so to speak, as to you need to meet my basic access needs. We shouldn't be having to do that. 
Thank you, Lydia. Yeah, and I think that on your last point, you know, we're talking about equity of experience here. We're talking about levelling the playing field so that everybody, regardless of neurodivergence, can have the same opportunity. Uh, so, Hester, you are next with your hand up, so I'll come to you next, please. Yeah, I just want to pick up on what Lydia was saying is about Rain Man and the stereotype. And I am a little bit older than Lydia. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's exactly the same when my husband goes into organisations and we do talks, etc. The, the assumption is that, you know, Rain Man is autistic or was autistic. And actually he had savant syndrome. So then you get into this whole superpower conversation and oh what special talents do you, you know does your husband have or your children have because they're autistic they must be like rain man and it's just this whole narrative that can be really um quite damaging um but just in terms of um what support i need um as a neurodivergent person um i think it's really important to talk about um like needs based um especially when it comes to um people at work and you talk about autism etc sort of people sometimes talk about high functioning autism rather than actually be, being needs based functioning labels can be really damaging so i think if you um basically it's about taking each person as they come isn't it with the i'm jumping ahead now to point number three i will go back to point number one so what support do i need i need organization strategies i need whiteboards everywhere i need dopamine seeking music that really makes my heart sing and fills me motivate makes me motivated um i also need to fake deadlines um that's something that i um do myself i pretend that i have a deadline much sooner than when it is or if someone's coming around to the house i will pretend they're coming around and quicker than they are to get this panic tidy in a go I don't tend to use loads of aids I do fidget quite a lot um, I tend to have a fiddle with me um, if I'm going out I always make sure I have water because interception is a huge thing with me having ADHD where I don't realize I'm thirsty until I'm sort of incredibly thirsty and I realize I haven't actually drunk all day um, the same with food so I quite often have a bottle of water and some snacks etc um, aids or equipment yeah noise cancelling headphones are really important and I just really want to briefly touch on access to work um, which is something that organizations um, can apply for their their staff their employees but also they people can apply for it themselves um, and with that you get lots of aids and equipment um, it's to do with whether you've got a physical disability or a hidden disability like autism ADHD dyslexia dyspraxia etc you don't actually need to be diagnosed except if you're dyslexic um, and actually they offer lots of um, aids and equipment etc whether it's like sort of text to reader or whether it's um, tablets um as i said noise cancelling headphone loops adhd coaching comes under that so there's lots of different things out there for people depending on their needs um for me it's definitely um having a fidget and a fiddle and notepads and just being able to um as i said sort of have access to food and snacks i'm like a gremlin really um so what are common stereotypes or misconceptions around neurodivergence of businesses should avoid i think it's assuming that one size fits all it's assuming that if you have um customers with adhd that oh they must behave like this they will be like that or if you're autistic or dyslexic etc so um whether that's in the workplace with um, employees or whether that's for customers, etc. It's understanding that everyone's different. There'll be some common traits and common challenges. Um, so it's understanding what those are, which we do a lot in our training, etc. But making sure you then don't just go, oh, well, these people have ADHD. They must all react the same in the same way. Thank you so much, Hester. And I loved your chat about fidgets there because I am sitting here with a fidget roller in my hand, which is um, helping me to, really helps me to keep regulated and focused during conversations like this. Um, yeah, I've one of the things that, that has made a really big difference to me this year, and if anybody would like to have a look, it's called an Ono Roller. I will drop a link in the chat. Um, my favorite thing about it is that it's so discreet, so it doesn't make any noise. It's very silent um, and I found that um, yeah a challenging thing to, to source a discrete fidget that doesn't make it. Uh, Hannah 
we will come to you last. Um, we're doing okay. We've got about ten minutes left on this slide, so you've got plenty uh, of chat through. That, you, you, you might want to be careful about telling me how much I've got that yeah. long. Blimey, that's dangerous. Um, so, in terms of support, I need um, what I found really interesting is that as a wheelchair user who is also neurodivergent, um, and as somebody who's moved around a lot of different clinical jobs in the five. Five years I've been a doctor. No, seven years I've been a doctor. Blimey, time flies when you're exhausted. Um, the support I've I've got, people see the wheelchair and it's like, right, we know what we need to do for you. We need to make sure the doors are wide enough. We need to make sure you can reach the keypads and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, do you need a couch that goes up and down for examining patients and all this kind of stuff? When I first qualified, nobody really knew whether doctors could be in wheelchairs. I was still quite new and quite shiny and slightly terrifying to every HR person I met um, but that's really really improved very quickly however when I say I've got ADHD you see this look of slight panic cross people's faces and I go like I don't know what I'm meant to do with that um, and I think that kind of emphasis on it's not one size fits all is really really key for this like we've heard um, because my needs are going to be very different so in terms of the kind of support I need the team that I work with, I've now been in this practice for nearly two and a half years, which is very abnormal as somebody who hasn't, I qualify next month fully as a GP, um, but it's very abnormal to get such a long stint in work. And I've really benefited from that, having that long period in one place, because they all know me, they know my different ways of working, they know that I might forget X, Y, and Z at some point, and that it's okay to just kind of quietly prod me and go, hi, Hannah, you might have possibly forgotten too. Um, and that I'll get things done without feeling like I'm being blamed or like I'm letting anyone down. Um, so that kind of understanding and the team are also very good at realising that I am terrible at remembering to eat or drink, um, which is quite a standard thing for junior doctors anyway. Um, but they're quite good at remembering to like bring me a cup of tea every so often and just check in that I have, you know, left my desk at some point in the 12 hours I'm here. Um, so having that kind of support around me has been really useful. Um, being in my clinic room, I've got loads of different aids and equipment that I use and it's I can do a show and tell now. So that's great. So, yes, noise cancelling headphones are my best friend. These ones do do white noise on the app that's connected to my phone if I need that. But actually, I'm quite good with music in the background and I work far better with music in the background. Obviously, not when I'm seeing patients. Um, they probably wouldn't respond to me wearing these as well. Um, and that's something I have to be really conscious of is I see people with a whole range of different diagnoses so it's about kind of finding that balance of what I need but also most importantly what the patient in front of me needs and working together um I find I do use tangles in some situations but actually I like my fidgeting to be quite productive so I knit a lot here's what I made earlier this is a lovely beanie I'm very proud of it um so when I'm in like board meetings or whatever I will constantly be knitting stuff oh I'm getting applause for the knitting that's lovely thank you um I have a notebook and at the end of every day, I write down if there is patients I want to make sure I've followed up or something. I'm just kind of like, I want to know what happens there. I'm a little bit concerned about that. Then I put their um, patient number in here. So it's all anonymous. So if it gets lost, it means nothing to anyone. Um, similarly, any cancer referrals or anything I do, I want to follow up. I've got a page for that. And I also do a little reflection each day on like key patients that have stuck with me. And that just means that I can bundle up everything that's happened in one very stressful day at work put it in the notebook and then leave because otherwise I was finding that I was kind of like really ruminating on the more traumatic or the more challenging cases I saw and finding it really, really hard to separate work and home. So by filling this in every day, it just gives me a bit of brain space away from work and I can put it in the notebook and then forget about it until I next come into work. Um, I am the doctor that gives everyone a post-it note because often the plans we make for patients can be quite complicated. So a lot of the time they'll leave with a bit of paper and I will have scribbled a list and gone through it with them. That means I know I've gone through everything with them. I can see it in front of me and they've got it as well, particularly if it's something quite complex. And finally, I think I have a whiteboard with a magnetic pen and every single job that I have to do if it's a referral or a phone call to someone I write it on here um, and I'm not allowed to leave this desk until everything on the whiteboard is done at the end of the day and that way I know I'm far less likely to forget things um, 
And finally, when I'm at home, I have a really clicky keyboard. Um, so it looks like something from the kind of like a typewriter keyboard, but it's pink, obviously, and like slightly chaotic. And it has a really good loud noise to it, which actually I find kind of helps me focus on typing and stops me getting so distracted because I'm kind of getting that immediate feedback of, look at me, I am writing words now. Isn't that great? Um, so there's loads of different aids, but that's just stuff that I found helpful. That wasn't stuff that anyone particularly was able to advise me to do it's just been a lot of trial and error with different things um and then finally around the kind of common stereotypes or misconceptions i think like hester and lydia have covered a lot of these i do find that yeah the tone of voice that people use with me when they find out i've got adhd is very different people do slow down their voice and do try and like talk to me in a far louder way and i'm like i have a medical degree like I I'm not stupid I'm not struggling I'm just I, I don't need you to change your behavior in the way you interact with me I'm I'm fine on that front but the assumptions are very much there and that is incredibly frustrating um so yes I think it's all about kind of speaking to the person in front of you and saying what do you need for me how can I make this easier for you what can I do to make like your life easier and if they say actually I'm completely fine thank you walk away and just just leave them to it um because so often as a wheelchair user and as a neurodivergent pe person i find people are trying to help in a way that's actually more disruptive to me i know what i need i'm gobby enough i'll tell you um what i don't need is people making assumptions and then yeah making everyone's life harder and more awkward as a result Thank you, Anna. So much useful insight there. Um, I absolutely love that notebook idea for your kind of separation from work and home. Um, I know that that is something that a lot of us struggle with, being able to switch off after work, etc. Um, and I also, I was nodding very heavily when you were talking about the fact that you're also a wheelchair user. And so people assume um, that kind of that's that's your only impairment as it were because that's an assumption that I get a lot I've got a very visible disability and um, I think that kind of a, a stereotype or a misconception there is is that just there is no such thing as intersectionality and and of course there is of course we're all individual and have various things that you can see and various things that you can't see um, we have had a um, a question in the chat that I'd like to bring out because I think we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so, the, on sorry, on this particular slide. So the questions come in to say any recommendations for how to support someone with ADHD who doesn't know themselves. So I, I assume that doesn't know what support they need themselves. Um, anybody like to jump in there, Hester? That was definitely a vaster swinger first. Go for it. it. ADHD brain. Right. Yeah, I think it. I'm just trying to work out whether or not they know they've got ADHD or whether they, the colleague is saying they don't know they've got ADHD and so therefore how do they support them? Because we get this quite often when we're working with organisations of people saying, but I know I've got a neurodivergent workforce and you will do because approximately 20% of the population are um, diagnosed with neurodivergent. But really important to know that 50% of those people don't know that they're neurodivergent so I got to my 40s before I knew I had ADHD um so I think someone just described they told me but when I asked what they need they said they didn't know yeah that's a bit like going oh what do you want for tea you're like I have no idea what are my options so it's almost being able to offer them like a pick and mix of solutions and you might not know what that is and what that is available at work but maybe by working out what things they're finding difficult and working through that and saying well actually my challenges are it might be time blindness so for people with ADHD I had about 10 minutes between um a podcast I was recording and then this and I'm thinking can I whiz to the shop and get a drink can I wait like no you have 10 minutes like my time blindness is just off the scale so I didn't obviously go so it might be that they suffer from time blindness and therefore their work being handed in is late or whatever or it might be that they're struggling with motivation because the dopamine isn't firing up and they're not excited about the work so it's just about trying to work out almost what their challenges are and then depending on what is available at work how you can support them um that's what i do a lot with the adhd coaching is just try and work out almost a bit of a user manual for that particular person but it, it can feel quite a big question when and you're doing the right thing by saying well how can i support you but it's that thing isn't it where you're like i don't know i just know i need support 
Um, so I hope that helps a little bit. Thank you, Esther. Um, we are going to need to move on very shortly, but I'm aware that Hannah and Lydia have both got their hands up. So, um, Hannah, I'll come to you first because you were number two. Um, if you can give us a very quick answer on this, okay, one, be appreciated. Very quick answer is time. Um, you don't need to solve all the problems immediately. And it's often about giving people time to work out what works for them and what doesn't and maintaining those lines of communication. So whenever we're discussing reasonable adjustments for a physical disability or a neurodivergence, it's always important to kind of plan a check in and kind of go, let's try some things. We'll check in in a couple of weeks time or we'll check in in a month and we can see what's working and what isn't. And that way you can really kind of plan and tailor stuff for that person without making them feel they need to have all the answers immediately when you first ask them because none of us do none of us know what's going to work in a particular job so giving that time and offering that I think is the most important thing thank you so much uh, Lydia we'll come to you again if you can do a very quick answer on this one it would be much appreciated two sentences maximum on this um so I'm not a, I do not have ADHD, however Hester gave me the best advice I've ever been given on how to interact with someone who has ADHD. It's in the phrasing of the question, so you, she highlighted how saying what is there for lunch, I think it was, like that's so big a question. If we change that to would you like lunch, yes, no, okay, would you like hot food, cold food and then process, processing it down this was the best piece of information she's ever given me in the sense of how as I as a non-ADHD individual phrase it um so that there's less kind of overwhelming that also works I found it re really worked well for autistic people if they have an executive functioning issue if they're given the same kind of structure if they if, such as you get the scenario about not needing support uh, not knowing what support to need it's the thing of the tailoring of the questions rather than just going tell me what you need I don't know but that's part of the diagnosis almost yeah yeah give me some options mm. yeah I think you know decision fatigue can be a really challenging thing for a lot of us who are neurodivergent and, and narrowing the options there is always useful right I'm going to move on to our next slide so we're talking about improving accessibility for and awareness of neurodivergence in businesses. So um, how it feels when your needs are misunderstood. Now, I feel like we've covered quite a bit of this already, but if you've got anything additional to bring out there, please do. How you feel businesses can better support people who are neurodivergent. So this is thinking about the welcome that you receive when you go to different businesses or venues and how we feel working environments can be made more accessible and the role of reasonable adjustments. So again, we've covered quite a bit on our own working environments and how we found that helpful. Um, so if there's anything additional to bring out there. Again, that would be helpful. Uh, so go for it, panelists. Feel free to raise hands. Uh, we had Hester number one. So we'll go with you first, please. Thank you. Um, I think when it comes to businesses, and as you say, sort of venues, etc., betting support people who are neurodivergent, I think it's making sure that the employees working in the venues know what neurodiversity is because um, I've seen someone in the chat saying that's why they don't wear a sunflower lanyard because Lydia was talking about sort of people talking down to her as if she's a child etc um, and I think there's that perception of or sort of um, misconception of that if you you know oh you're autistic so these are your needs or oh you have ADHD so these are your needs and like Lydia said the access able guides are amazing because my children are, as I said, I think 12 and 14. Not that I don't know their ages. I can't if I told you their ages. Um, they are 12 and 14. And um, when we go somewhere new, it naturally causes anxiety. So being able to go on the website and then have a look at the guides, that's great. You then get to the venue and you're like, so this is what it might look like. This is where we might sit. This I spend a lot of time on Google Images showing my son. He's like, I don't remember going there. I'm like, we've been there before look, this is what it looks like. And then he's like, oh, yeah. But then when you get there, obviously, the staff are different, et cetera, naturally. But actually, 
then if their reaction may be to the fact that my son isn't looking, he, he doesn't sit down um, if we go out for like lunch, for example. So in a restaurant, he won't sit down. Um, so he's standing on the edge of the table and he's probably got his hood up and he's got his AirPods in and he's on his phone. So he looks like he's being a bit of a sort of stroppy preteen. But actually he's not. He's autistic and is overwhelmed and we're trying to get him out for lunch. So I think by having that um, awareness and understanding of actually what that could mean, um, also, we have to take food for him. He, he's he got ARFID, which is a, an eating disorder, so he won't order anything from the menu. So I used to years ago, oh, he's got he's got um, sort of, um, what did I say? Oh, intolerances. Then they'd whip out the intolerance menu and you'd be like, oh, God. So now I'm just like, yeah, we've bought him sandwiches. And now we get the little Tupperware box and pop it on a plate or whatever. And I think it's just having that understanding and that looking through a lens of kindness, I think. Um, it's a really great way for businesses to support neurodivergent individuals. If they know what the sunflower lanyard means and understands that, that's amazing. Um, as a family, we mainly use that when we're traveling. My children think they're too cool to use it now. Um, and also, as some people have said in the chat, then that you then get certain perceptions wearing with a sunflower lanyard. Um, so yeah, I just think the training and the awareness and the understanding um that employers can do to help their staff understand um is absolutely huge fellow Arford mum thank you Sarah it's really tough it's really really tough but I think yeah looking at things through a lens of kindness I think is huge um the working environments could be um how can working environments be more accessible what is the role of reasonable adjustments as you said Carrie we sort of um Carrie we sort of touched on that a little bit and I think it's about the one size doesn't fit all it's about knowing also firstly who to go and ask you know like I remember when my um husband um shared that he was autistic with his boss he worked for a really big corporate company and um he shared he was autistic and his boss laughed and said we don't look autistic and my husband was like I don't know where to go with that and then he said I just thought you had a stick up your ass and it's just like that's when we decided to launch perfectly autistic because we spoke to a lot of other people who'd had this awful negative reaction of as we call it coming out as as neurodivergent and actually the reaction was just shocking so i think there are so many reasonable adjustments that um can be put into place a lot of them are really cheap really reasonable don't cost anything we were um working with an organization recently and they said we've got a new employee started he's autistic but he's just not really getting on it's not really working we're like what's going on why talk us through it well so we put him in the corner <laughs> we were like let's just take a few steps back why did you put him in the corner well because he's autistic so we thought he'd want a quiet space we're like did you ask if he wanted a quiet space and he's like well no but we've read that autistic people like a bit more quiet maybe not so interrupted and we were just like you've fallen at the first hurdle you know you need to ask your employees what they want you need to ask the neurodivergent person like we said at the beginning with language ask how they want to be referred to ask what support they want ask where they want to sit you know and the thing is you put these things into place for everybody so you don't just say oh I always do Barry in accounts you're dyslexic or whatever you you don't just sing, signal these people out you put these things into place that then benefit everybody um, and I think that's really important is it's not, you know, you make it a level playing field, really. Um, but, yeah, there's lots of things around lighting, obviously around um, wearing noise cancelling headphones. Um, I was coaching someone recently and they were saying, but I don't want noise cancelling headphones because they feel really big. I want AirPods or like noise cancelling buds. But their employer said, well, but, you know, I don't think you want those because autistic people like headphones. And I had to email and go, where have you got this from? They're like, well, we Googled and they prefer headphones like they it's like don't why are we doing this this assumption um so i think there's lots of reasonable adjustments that can be made um they don't have to cost much at all they can be really simple but it's about bringing everyone on that journey and it's about bringing it from the top down so that you know managers ceos bosses of venues etc are making sure that they're leading by example and and i think you know to summarize what you just said there in a nutshell Hester, i think it's about um having having those options having those tools yeah. available as options so so you know as you've said it's personal preference it's mm. not it's not that all autistic people like like big headphones <laughs> at all i'm sorry <laughs> i can't even say that without laughing <laughs> I um, um so i think it's about you know knowing what things might be helpful and being able to provide options of them. Um, so we've got roughly about five minutes left on this slide before we'll move on to case studies. So Hannah, I'm gonna to come to you next. Tracking, thank you. So I think the first thing I need is, I need people to understand is that no, we are not all a bit ADHD. Um, 
because I hear that so much. Oh, well, we're all on a spectrum, really, aren't we, Hannah? We all forget things sometimes. We all doze off sometimes. And he's like, no, no, that's not, that's not what it is. We all pass urine. We don't all have water infections. Like, <laughs> there's a big difference. Um, so, yeah, I f think that understanding that actually these diagnoses are diagnoses and that as a result there are additional things that you can and should put into place is really key and it's not just a oh you're just a bit more different no no that's not how this works um in terms of how businesses can better support people who are neurodivergent if you support your neurodivergent staff who you definitely have whether you know about it or not if you create a workforce and an environment which works for them they will automatically help your neurodivergent customers, patients, whoever it is. Because if they are well supported, they will naturally do what they do to support people like them. We we get it. We have that shared understanding to a degree. We're all slightly different, but we have more awareness and understanding. So I think if you don't think you have neurodivergent staff, then you have neurodivergent staff who aren't telling you. And that's a big issue. And you need to be asking why. You need to go right back to first principles and going, right, if we don't think we've got anyone who's autistic or has ADHD, then they're not feeling safe coming forwards. And we need to ask why that is, because the chances are that lack of safety is reflecting through to the people you're working with in terms of customers, patients, whoever it is. I'm saying patients because I know there are some NHS people on this call. So I'm seeing you in the chat. Um, and finally, I think it comes back to what I was saying. Reasonable adjustments is an ongoing process and reasonable adjustments are not there to enable you to work. They are there to enable you to work to the best of your ability. So it's not like, right, we've got you in the building. In you go. You can do the job now. It's about getting the best out of your staff and reasonable adjustments are there to do that. So. People tend to go right, go, right, they're in, they're in their corner, they've got their headphones, they've got their little whiteboard, they'll be fine, crack on. We've done our reasonable adjustments bit. But it has to be an ongoing process. It has to be an iterative process. And it has to be something that kind of acknowledges that we want these people to be able to work to the best of their abilities and to do their best. And that means some of us are going to have to work a bit differently. And that's okay. Because the people you're working for and with are going to be different as well. So it's about acknowledging that diversity within society, I think. So the first question was, how does it feel when effectively the needs are not being met? It is massively invalidating. We should not really have to be doing the emotional labour of this. There are also, so I work as a journalist who specialises in disability issues. I want to pick up on the Sunflower Lanyard. Because the the thing about that scheme was that the Sunflower Lanyard was distributed from organisations that had training in place to support neurodivergent staff. However, an issue with the pandemic meant that they were having to deal with forgeries. And I was have at the this is in kind of September 2020 and has carried on. I investigated this for Insider and basically they were spending a lot of time having to deal with the forgeries of the lanyard rather than the training which is unfortunate. Um, I also want to add, so I've seen that the Oliver McGowan training has been cited in the chat. So there are two things that I want to put to this. First of all, the Oliver McGowan training sort of came out of a need to support autism and learning disability patients within organisations. It's not just, it was not originally intended to just be about autistic individuals because Oliver McGowan himself did in fact have a learning disability. That being said, um, it has been criticised in some parts. Just because something is there does not, it needs to be person led rather than sort of being kind of like almost sort of in bits almost. I have a lot of time for Paula McGowan. She and I have talked on Twitter before. Um, but it's just the thing of kind of like very often some things I find they are always like when I go into an establishment, it's previously when I've made a complaint about my access needs not being met, it's always the kind of thing where it goes, oh, well, we did this training and um, basically shove it. Um, it's an ongoing process and you everyone can still afford to learn and it's not just kind of like one size fits all as Hannah was saying 
When it comes to autistic individuals, I really want to underline this. You can afford to learn from us always. It access, disability, how to support neurodivergent customers. It's an ongoing process. You can't just sort of uh, arrive at an end point. That's the true definition of being an ally to us. Um, how can working environments be made more accessible? What is the role of reasonable adjustments? Again, reasonable adjustments are an ongoing process. It's not just a kind of like definitively, right, we've reached the point of full accessibility and that's that and it doesn't continue onwards. It's not. I think Lydia's last point is just so important um, around you can you can learn from us always. You can you can learn from the lived experience of um of disabled people of neurodivergent people always um and we should never stop learning we should always use it as an opportunity to um to grow and develop more so we're now going to look at some case study examples of good practice um from organizations who have created um some resources to support neurodivergent people. So I am going to show two slides that focus on um, some, some case study examples, and then I'll ask each of our panelists to share their thoughts on how the initiatives resonate with them and how they think they might be helpful. So our first slide covers a visual guide to shopping at Tesco. Um, so this is an easy read guide that's designed to make the shopping trip easier um, for people with conditions such as autism. It's really there to try and manage expectations in a visual way and in a way that is easy to consume. Um, the focus is on images and small amounts of text. And then our second example, um, and I know that this has been mentioned, I think Lydia, you mentioned this earlier around sensory backpacks and the importance of them. So um, we had a look at um, Camera Obscura, um, which is one of the venues that we that we cover under Access Able, and they have sensory backpacks, which include things like ear defenders, sunglasses, um, a torch, an activity sheet, and a variety of sensory toys. So I'd like to know from our panelists how you feel the initiatives shared here might help you or the neurodivergent people to better access businesses and venues. Hannah. Um, so Having ADHD, um, I personally don't really need kind of easy read guides to get around the supermarket or that sort of thing. But what I do often need is some kind of map or at least plan of where things are. Not because I can't find them, but because if I'm just kind of let loose in a massive superstore, I will end up picking up a whole load of really interesting random things I didn't think I needed, didn't know existed, um, and just got distracted and overexcited by, and absolutely nothing that I did actually have on my shopping list. Whereas if I can kind of plan a little bit in advance and go, right, I need to go to the fish counter, the vegetables to get this, I need to go to the freezer section to get this, and then back to the counter. If I can make a very clear route in my head, I will get what I need and not a whole load of extra random crap. I am somebody for whom the Aldi middle aisle, I, I can't go into Aldi without my partner with me um, because I will come home with a kayak. I'm a wheelchair user. I don't know how I plan on getting in and out of a kayak, but I would come home with one. Um, so <laughs> I think like that sort of stuff would be is really useful for me is just having a really clear plan so I can go in with a plan of action um, as opposed to, yeah, just random supermarket sweep, which never actually picks up the stuff I've promised I'd go to the shop for. Thank you, Hannah. Um, that really made me laugh. I love the idea of, of you not being allowed in Aldi and supervised because because you'll come home with a few groceries and some random wonders from the middle aisle. I love that. Um, Hester, we'll come to you next. Um, yeah, I think the um, the idea of the sensory of the guides, etc. I think, um, but like Hannah said, for me personally with ADHD, 
I don't necessarily need them, but my children do. And I think um, I'm constantly looking at things through a, a mum lens. Um, I think the sensory backpacks sound um, look really brilliant. I know. I don't know if you get to take them home or I see and they just get left there. Yeah, Lydia's saying no, I did think that. So they get stayed there. And I know my children would feel a bit strange wearing like ear defenders that someone else has worn or maybe the fiddle toys, etc. that other people have touched and things. So I think... Um, that's something um to bear in mind but i just love the idea that they're thinking about it and it's there and it's some other children and other adults as well it's not to do with it's not age dependent um would absolutely love that i think the tesco guide looks really great there and what i really like about it and um, and it's a bit like that with the social stories is almost you can't have like too much detail so it's almost like you're going to tesco's and i know there's like a whole debate on instagram about what you call it is it big tesco's little tesco's mini tesco's all that jazz we have big tesco's and mini tesco's in our at home um and i think that's done perfectly getting into the store because you say to a child we're going to tesco's or we're going to the supermarket and actually but that was a really small tesco's we were expecting a big one etc um and then around the store again I, th I think the guides personally are really invaluable um i think they're they're really useful i think um as it says there it's just to make shopping trips a little bit easier and that's the thing isn't it it's just that a step forward um so yeah i think the visual guides are great excellent thank you Esther. and i think that's a, that's a really important point because i do think you know sensory backpacks have become more popular is my understanding but actually it might not always be the preference of the person to use something that has been used by other people Example. yeah I just want to jump in there as well it's a bit like sensory rooms so you get loads of places and they're like well, we've got a sensory room <laughs> the sensory room at Legoland is enough to tip you into a meltdown it is lights and flashing and whizzing and all oh, my days and you're already in Legoland and there's music and people and characters and everything so it's quite I find it quite interesting that almost people whereas we often talk about with organizations about having like a quiet space and again that's open for everybody that's it doesn't you don't have to be neurodivergent to use it it's just someone that needs a bit of time out so you don't sit there chatting on your phone it's a bit like the quiet carriage in a in a train but sensory rooms people now seem to think that oh my gosh children are gonna or adults as well are gonna want bubbles and lights and neon strips and actually when you're feeling quite overwhelmed you walk into a sensory room actually you just maybe need to have a bit calmer a bit more muted just thought i'd mention that yeah, yeah, absolutely. It raises a really good point. There was an example that I wanted to include today, but that I didn't unfortunately get the the detail and the visuals of in time to be able to share. Um, however, um, we have sort of been informed in the course of our work over the last week or so about a sensory room available for public use that anybody can use and all of the lighting controls temperature controls noise controls air controls are individual so you can go in and literally set it up to your own individual needs and preferences and i think that's what we'd all like to see in sensory rooms isn't it lydia we'll come to you last we have got about five minutes left and then we're going to go to q a Okay, so when it comes to sensory backpacks, I think it's about the execution of how they're done. So somebody has also mentioned about um, token gestures in the chat, and I completely agree with them. I was at a shopping centre in December, not where I really wanted to be. Um, I'm autistic. Um, they are like hell on earth sometimes. But it was what struck me is that the sensory backpack was only advertised for children like they were actually only just photographed with children as if to suggest that this was only child appropriate and child friendly added to that i also really agree with what hester said about cleanliness and that kind of thing as a long covid patient it's the thing of where like everything is sanitized and all that very often they can't i've had experiences of like you know friends of friends and all that kind of thing where the objects in the backpack have in fact been dirty and not really cleaned however there is um i think it's called edinburgh festival um do correct me if this is wrong where they actually give out the backpack to the individual so that you can keep it and go home and then it's like you know disposable and all that kind of thing um we've sort of talked about on the chat there's a few people saying about food and things i 
always joke that supermarkets should be rearranged by neurodivergent individuals simply because if we arranged it it would be more efficient and like you know i love the idea of coming home with a kayak and that kind of thing the access able guides can help in some senses which i found massively useful in the sense of like how to navigate and that kind of thing such as the getting into but it's the kind of like the actual inside that can be an issue. I really like the first, I'm not sure what you called the quick guide, the other example. Thank you, the visual guide to shopping at Tesco. Um, the thing about this is sometimes that kind of resource can be hard to access because it's not necessarily kind of like an organizational priority. So if it was, you know, kind of like on the home page, rather than having to spend 10 minutes sort of scrolling and going through like the back end, if you'd like, it would be so less stress inducing if there's like, you know, a PDF and that kind of thing. I really, again, really good insight. So thank you so much, Lydia. Um, I think, yeah, sensory backpacks as an initiative are excellent, but we need to make sure that they're executed correctly is what I'm bringing out of kind of mm -hmm. both of yours and Hester's answers there. So we are now going to move on to Q&A. So we have time for questions until about 2.25. Um, I can see that the chat is absolutely, it's just going off, isn't it? It's just, it's, it's so vibrant and, um, yeah, that's that's very encouraging for us all to see. You're obviously also passionate about this topic. Um, so what I will suggest is that anybody who would like to ask a question, please use the raise hand function. So this is for anybody in our audience. Use the raise hand function and I will allow your microphone and then you'll be able to ask your question. And you should now be able to unmute your microphone, Alistair, and ask your question. For me, my question was more about digital products such as websites. What kind of are the most important considerations for designing things like search results or things like this? Any of our panellists feel they want to jump in with any advice here? So, Hannah. Yeah, I can briefly loop in. I mean, I think the I'm I'm not great with tech because by definition, I tend to get very easily distracted by all the different things going on. So from my perspective, you know, I can read vast swathes of text and all that sort of stuff, but it's about keeping things as simple as possible. There seems to be a big move to making like websites and things super, super fancy with loads of different search functionalities and loads of different drop down menus and all this kind of stuff that I find really hard to navigate. So just having really simple, this is how you search things. This is, you know, a very clear drop down menu that doesn't go off in multiple directions. I don't want loads of ways of doing one thing. I just want one simple, obvious way. Um, so I'm a big fan of the keep it simple stupid kiss technique <laughs> um because otherwise i just lose patience and roll away because i just my brain can't handle it thank you Anna. um lydia did you have something that you wanted to bring out for this question as well i think hannah's answered the question more eloquently than i could ever do to be honest <laughs> <laughs> excellent i'm happy with that thank you thank um, you very much Thank you for your question, Alistair, much appreciated. Um, so I can see that our next audience member to ask a question was Jennifer. Jennifer, I've allowed your microphone. You should now be able to unmute and ask your question. Hi there, thank you. Um, so mine is actually in relation to uh, training for the team. We have been very, so I work for National Museum Scotland and I'm the manager of our visitor experience team, so all of the front of house. Um, and we welcome approximately 2 million visitors a year to our main building. So our team um, engage with lots of different visitors um, and our team is also very diverse as well. We've been very fortunate in that Accessable uh, work with us for access guides and they come and visit, um, they consult with us and they've also provided us with bespoke training for all of our team in, in a variety of different um, disability awareness, including neurodivergence. But it, it's, um, I've got a question about some other training. So we have, um, 
what we call our customer service training, service standards training, you know, sort of the basics of meeting and greeting and providing an excellent visitor experience. And one of our service standards is um, to acknowledge visitors, make eye contact and smile. And I'm aware that potentially the wording of make eye contact may be difficult for some people to do. And it's not that we expect everybody that they have to do that. So just any suggestions on how we can maybe phrase that or alternative, you know, additional wording that we can put in there to reassure our team, particularly when they're new and they're joining us, that you don't. Thank you. Excellent question. Lydia, you were first to put your hand up in response. So we'll come to you first and then Hester next. Um, so the thing about eye contact, I really want to emphasise. So um, it's a part of the autism diagnostic criteria in the sense of being unable to make eye contact. But the thing about this is, I really want to point out that other territories don't actually have this on their diagnostic criteria. So in the sense of when we talk about kind of meeting people socially, I don't see why it couldn't be phrased as just kind of like a friendly open greeting rather than there's been sort of um you know when you go to an organization and it has kind of like sales assistants who work on commission and sometimes they follow you around the shop going would you like to buy this product um i had an experience recently i'm not going to identify the organization um where i went in and it, I was immediately very uncomfortable when it was like that, like always sort of unblinking, making eye contact type thing. There needs to be less of an emphasis on eye contact and maybe just being open and friendly because not, as you say, not everyone can do it. But it's also in some circumstances, it can be taken the wrong way, such as being a sign of aggression, if done not properly, shall we say. <laughs> Thank you, Lydia. And I think we just we just had a really excellent response to this actually in the chat, which is, you know, we should be in a place where we can share with customers, you know, our own neurodiversity um, for customer understanding and and we should be able to feel comfortable with that. Um, and, and I think that's that's, you know, it's an excellent point and an excellent way of, of almost empathising there and um, I suppose making an authentic connection you know we don't we don't need eye contact always for an authentic connection Esther. hi yeah i just completely echoing what lydia said really i was thinking about just almost like um something about like just but you know welcoming guests so it doesn't have to even reference the eye contact it's just greet and welcome guests as they arrive kind of thing um like lydia said the whole eye contact thing is a whole could do another webinar on that but we won't um so yeah just literally greeting with like a warm welcome something like that's always nice because then people can then take from that what they mean a warm welcome means different things to different people but then it's open to interpretation from themselves um i love the idea of people being able to say i'm autistic so just so you're aware but equally that takes a lot of courage the person may not know they're autistic they, my husband wasn't diagnosed till he was 44 so you've got all those other nuances as well but hopefully at some point we'll be in a an amazing world in a few years time where we can openly say yeah this is me here we go um but i think sadly we're a long way off that but i just think something like a sort of a nice you know offering guests a warm welcome or visitors a warm welcome i think is quite nice thank you both does that does that does that answer your question you have yeah that's great thank you thank you um so next on my list of people who've raised their hand to ask a question at least so, Georgia, I'm just going to allow your microphone. You should now be able to unmute your microphone and ask your question. Um, so, first of all, thank you so much. I've learned so much today. This has been absolutely amazing and just really appreciate all of the insights that everyone on the panel has given. Um, we're, as a business, kind of at the start of our neurodiversity awareness kind of journey um our data declaration is quite low so we actually don't know exactly how many of our colleagues are disabled but we know of course like you guys are saying about the kind of the stats around it i think you were saying that 20 percent of all people um will probably be neurodiverse so we know that we need to do training around it but kind of difficult knowing how to approach it in terms of is it something that we need to make mandatory for everyone or mandatory for all managers um just any kind of suggestions or insights any best practice i'm i'm all ears 
Thank you. Excellent question. Um, Hester, you were first with your hand up for a response, so we'll come to you. Um, I think I just love the fact that it's on your radar and that you want to be talking about it. I think for us, quite often, we offer sort of introduction to neurodiversity workshops or talks. We've got um, what we've got coming up, Neurodiversity Celebration Week, haven't we? We've got Autism Acceptance Month, etc. And I just think having those nice conversations, just even internally at first or getting an external partner in, I think is a really great, great way just to kind of start discussing it. If you've got any um, neurodivergent colleagues that are happy to talk about their diagnosis, that's quite often what happens in the beginning is that then the sort of chat starts to come and then people feel that it's a safe space to open up. Because I think whenever you look at raising awareness of neurodiversity um, or doing things, etc., it's one of those you've then got to, we will sort of say it's a bit like opening up a Pandora's box. You've <laughs> then got to have the support and the sort of um, things in place to actually be able to support those colleagues rather than just saying, um, you know, that actually, um, what was I saying? So, yeah, rather than just saying that, um, you know, everybody needs to have this neurodiversity training, I think it should be mandatory. It's just about starting conversations and um, and basically, like I said earlier, sort of leading from the top. So if you've got anyone internally that can talk about that, I think that's really, really impactful. But I think, yeah, an awareness session, introduction to neurodiversity, something like that, even just showing you've been on this and then looking into external partners, etc. I think is really impactful. Thank you, Pastor. Lydia, anything you'd like to bring out for this question? Um, I think the thing to really emphasise about this is, first of all, it needs to be person led. It drives me mad when organisations, they can't, they will come to me in like, you know, if I go to an appointment or if I'm acting in a consultancy, where they go, oh, so we've done all this training about neurodiversity and um, yeah, so we just come out with all these stereotypes and um, but we're not going to listen to you even though you're an autistic person. Training should be person led because we're the experts and I try my best to not sound arrogant when I say that, but it avoids mistakes, it avoids stereotypes, it enables the social model of disability. I also wanted to add that any kind of thing in a kind of a management leadership position I think it should be neurodiversity affirming and this should be underlined because it's still such a rare occurrence I cannot of apart from access able and kind of like you know in this field I can't think of any organization apart from my own that's actually neurodiversity affirming other organisations I've come across have always been like, oh, yeah, and so autism, it's like this really big, scary problem that we need to solve very often because it's not run by the people. And then it's just it's about then they start to come with the idea of we work against rather than work with. If you work with a different brain, be it ADHD, autistic, whatever, you will get more done and it will be more productive and more conducive. And um, that's only what I wanted to add really. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're happy that that answers your question and anything that you'd like to follow up on. No, thank you so much. That's really helpful. Can I just really quickly add, I think just on Lydia's point, I think it's really important for whoever does neurodiversity training to be neurodivergent themselves, because I think so often you get people going, well, no, because I've read loads. So there we go. And it's like, I can't do training on racism awareness. I'm not a person of colour. I, I don't, you know, just because I've read a book about it doesn't mean that I can then run some training. And I think that's really important is whoever does the training is um, neurodivergent. And also, like Lydia says, you know, it comes from it from that. Also, I think you know, like a positive standpoint as well, like the benefits. Yes, there are huge challenges as well. We talk about those and we raise those, but actually it's about the benefits and what a you know neurodivergent workforce brings to the company. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hester. So I think we've probably got time for one more question. And I can see that Natasha has her hand raised. So Natasha, I have allowed your microphone, so you should now be able to unmute and ask your question. Hello. <laughs> Hi. So my question is mainly around about the travel industry and obviously traveling um, with being neurodivergent and stuff like that. Now, with looking on the travel company's websites, its main focus is on about wheelchair accessibility. Now, myself, I speak with customers on a daily basis. So 
I've had a couple of customers who have rung up um, and say they've booked their father in for wheelchair assistance and then had spoken about how nervous they are of travelling because they have ADHD or they have autism. I explain that we have steps in place as well for you know, the hidden disability. So that could be airport assistance, that could be around even the travelling, the transfers, the hotel. We look at the whole journey, not only for wheelchair users um, or people who use oxygen, that kind of thing, but we look at the hidden disability aspect around things as well. I don't believe that that's widely advertised as much as it should be. So I think it's mainly on how can the travel companies kind of get that more out there for customers to know that it doesn't have to be a visible um, disability for any assistance to travel. Everyone can travel and there is help out there for everyone. And I think that is one main thing that we kind of need to get across to the customers instead of them ringing up to find that out. Thank you so much for your question. Um, in terms of who had their hand up first. We're going to go to Hester. Thank you. I think it was Lydia, but I'll just quickly say my piece. So we're probably running out of time. I know Access Able do loads of work with TUI, um, don't they, with the guides um, around the um, being able to, you know, travelling when you're neurodivergent is huge. And I, through Access Able, I've done some training for TUI as well um, around how to make that um, neurodiversity what am I trying to say? It feels like it's been a long webinar. I've been talking a lot. So what I'm trying to say is succinctly is that neurodiversity and travelling is really huge and can cause loads of anxiety. So 100% you're right, Natasha, that actually there's loads more you can do. And I remember sharing when I did the training for TUI through Access Able, as I said, I don't really think of us because we don't have any physical disabilities in our family of then seeking special assistance. I now know we can and I do that regularly when we go on holiday. But actually, you're right. It's about maybe sometimes reframing those words. Um, so it's something around hidden disabilities or um, et cetera on the website so that people know where to look, because I think that's just really important um, is to be able to offer that and have that. And I remember Tui saying that, like with my son having ARFID, you know, they might be able to offer extra baggage that wouldn't cost anything, et cetera, to be able to support mm -hmm. that. Whereas I would have assumed that extra baggage was if you needed, you know, medical supplies, et cetera. So I think there's um, there's a whole load of work that can be done around that. And I know already um, Access Able do a lot of great work with TUI. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. Um, we are short on time, so I'll come to Lydia next and then Hannah, but I am going to have to ask you to be very quick with you. I think it's about the kind of syndication of information in answer to the question. So, and I say this in the sense, so the last time I flew out of the UK, I ended up having to register myself as, and I quote, brain damaged for any kind of access help onto the plane that I was not given because the staff then tried to tell me, oh, we only do stuff for wheelchair users, despite the fact that there was a great big sign right behind me saying hidden disabilities this way. The information was just not there because mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure why. They have nothing about kind of like autism, ADHD, etc. And they've got very aggressive about it, even though I did even pointed out saying previously they had like, you know, they'd had this training before, like from a multiplicity of organisations. So it's about making the information accessible. So if it's on a website, put it up front. If it's in mm -hmm. a PDF, make it available. If you have an app, do like put it everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. And Natasha, is that helpful in terms of Yes, I, th I think obviously with feeding this back, um, and obviously what I've learned today, I think it's mainly important to get obviously Access Able's link onto the website. Um, it, on the website for TUI, it does actually explain, you know, what are your needs? Are you able to walk through the airport? There's nothing really on there in regards to the hidden disability aspect, that kind of thing. So not all disabilities are visible and that needs to be widely recognised especially throughout the travel industry and it just helps everybody then. 
Thank you so much, Natasha. Um, I can see we've got one more hand up from Miranda. I'm so sorry, but we don't have time for any more questions. However, in the next slide, I'm going to share my contact details so that anybody with further questions can follow up with me directly. And we will do our best to um, field them to pan panel members and or answer it to queries ourselves. So thank you so much to our panellists for sharing their valuable thoughts and experiences. Um, we hope that the session has given you some insight into supporting neurodivergent people. We're trying to gather views and experiences on accessing venues and accessibility information. We'd be so grateful if you could complete particularly the feedback form because that feedback is so valuable to help us plan future webinars. And if you are also able to complete our user survey and share that within your own networks, it will go a long way to informing Accessable's future work. Thank you again to our panellists. Thank you to everybody who's joined us. Thank you to Lucy Wood for your excellent work in wrangling the chat today. No small feat. Um, here are my contact details if you have any queries that haven't been addressed today or any questions that we weren't able to get to feel free to get in touch with me directly thank you so much everyone